<laughs> How's it going? How are you guys doing? Doing good? Awesome. If you have your Bibles, Genesis 1. If you don't know where that is, just open to the first page. And there you have it. We'll be in Genesis 1, maybe Genesis 2. We'll see how this goes. Um, I just kind of start the clock and get running, and we just end when we end. That's how I tend to do it. We'll see how fun that is. I'm excited to be with you guys. Man, it has been a long time since I've been with you guys. Um, I don't know if anyone's been coming to the porch for a long time, but I spoke a handful of times like four or five years ago, did launch retreat back then, and then took a big break from the porch family, but it's good to be back. I miss you guys. You guys are awesome. It's good to be back. Um, so again, the series, Dateable. I'm just going to jump into it because I am so excited for tonight. I'm excited for us to lean in to the scriptures. Now, there's kind of this axiom that I think is we would all resonate with, and it's essentially this. It's essentially that so many of us, uh, and I know this resonates with me and specifically in my uh, mid-20s, that life can be going poorly. Everything around you can be kind of breaking apart or falling apart, but if you have a relationship that's relatively healthy or you're doing it the right way, it's crazy how everything can feel fine. And the flip is true as well, right? Where everything in your life can be going well. Jobs, promotion, maybe you know a promotion with money, certain things, certain whatever, but if there's something in a relationship that is breaking you that's difficult or you're making unwise choices that's kind of destroying your soul in your heart, then it's crazy how it feels like everything is breaking. What I'm saying with that is there's something about God's design for human relationships that is central to who we are. And I mean that, by the way, single, dating, or not, right? I mean in the sense of just how we feel about them, how we think about them, how we enter into them. There's something about human relationships that is very close to how God wired us, how God designed us, and who we are. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're gonna talk about what is God's design for human flourishing, for human relationships, for sexuality, and all these different types of things. We're gonna go all the way back to the beginning and look at what I like to say is the blueprint, okay? Now, when I say the word blueprint, what do you think of? I don't know about you, I actually think of Jay-Z's albums, anyone else? Okay, besides that, what you probably think of is you know, architectural drawings or something of that nature. A blueprint tends to be a framework, a map, a thing that you look at in regards to showing you the design of something before what? Before you go on and build something, right? Before you go on and do something. And so it is with God's design for us with relationships where he has a blueprint. If you try to go forward without it, have fun building a house without a blueprint, see how that goes. It doesn't end well. It doesn't end well, but if we listen to the wisdom of God, how he's created and wired us to work, then that's what leads us to flourishing. So we're gonna go back and look at that. So again, if you have your Bibles, let's go to Genesis chapter one. And I'm not gonna cover all of the points, but I think there's, um, what I wanna do is cover, I think, some of the more often missed ones. And so we'll just start reading and go from there. Genesis chapter one, let's go down to verse 26 for me. I might have a tough time reading it too because my two-year-old just ripped this yesterday, so yeah. I mean, the kid's just ripping the scriptures. Like, what kind of hatred for God is that? Okay. <laughs> um, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man, what? In his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blesses them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we're just gonna sit there for a second because there's a lot in there, but the first one I wanna zoom in on is what we saw there. What, what, what was a word that came up just a couple times in three verses? It starts with an I. Image, chapter one, verses 27 and 28. In the image of God, you were created, male and female, in the image of God, he created them. Now, what does that mean? I wanna sit there for a second because I know I didn't have a ton of church context growing up. I didn't start walking with the Lord till 19, but I had enough to kind of feel like maybe I heard some of these ideas. And at least to me growing up, I always was either taught or just assumed that the image of God in the scriptures was about characteristics of God passed on to us. Does that make sense? Kind of like God is loving, God is holy, God is creative, all these different types of things. And so that's what it means to be created in the image of God, right? That's kind of just how I assumed what that phrase meant. Now at some level that's true, but that's not what the text is trying to say. That's almost a byproduct definition. Image of God in the ancient Near East, which literally again is where this text was written out of and from, you have to understand the context, was actually not about characteristics, but it was about vocation. Vocation, job, 
right? You have been given a job to do because you are a royal signpost, a royal ambassador of creator Yahweh. Are you tracking? That God has actually commissioned you and having the image of God in you means you are to be a small divine reflector, or I mean a reflector of the divine. And so whether that's in relationships, by the way, or whether that's in your job, whether that's how you treat money, you are to be a divine reflector in your world, in your context, in your city. Is that true? Are you trying to reflect God's image or are you resisting the image he puts on you? That's, by the way, how you define sin, is resisting the image he has put on you. Do you reflect who he is and how he has created you to be? It has to do with your vocation. He has given us jobs to do. Another way to think about it is, again, I always had this idea that, like, here's a question. What would you say peak spirituality is? What would you say peak Christianity is? Most of us, if we think of, like, the high moment, it's what? It's what? Maybe sitting in our prayer closet, praying for five hours, listening to Hillsong and maybe Maverick City. Anyone else? <laughs> Great music, by the way. But I might just critique that a little bit and say that's not what it means to be human. That's actually what it means to be an angel. You ever thought about that? So what does it mean to be an angel in scripture? Anytime an angel shows up in scripture, what are they doing? They're basically kneeling. I mean, besides the few times they have a human interaction when they're around God, what are they doing? They're kneeling at his feet, worshiping him. Now, is that a part of what it means to be human? Yes, absolutely. But does Genesis say that's what it means to be human? I don't see that anywhere in Genesis. What do I see? You are created as an image bearer of God, which means you are a human, and human means to work. Go do the job I have given you. So many times we over-spiritualize this version of Christianity and under-spiritualize this version, which is God has given you a job. That is to properly reflect him in every avenue of your life. Another way to think about it is being an image bearer of God, and again, in relationships, is almost like being a 45-degree angled mirror. I know that's a weird way to put it, right? But any geometry students in here, if God is kind of like giving his love, his goodness, his grace, and who he is and his character down on a 45-degree angled mirror, where does it go? Any geometry students out, out there? A 45 degree angle mirror, if it comes down, it goes out, right? So we are to reflect, we are to absorb all that he is, all that he, um, who he is, and what he has for us in creation and reflect it out into the world. But by the way, it's a two-way street. What it means to be an image bearer is actually to take all of creation and do what? Create, create order out of, uh, uh, out of chaos and reflect it back up to him in worship. So it's a two-way street of that's what it means to be an image bearer. One other fun fact, do you know when they've done a lot of um, digging and archaeological sites in antiquity and they find like, you know, uh, old statues and ruins of like statues of like old Roman emperors like a Caesar or a Nero or something like that? Do you know whenever they find those statues, it's always thousands of miles away from Rome and they've never found one statue in Rome of Caesar or Nero? Now, why is that? Why would you guess that there's a bunch of Caesar statues thousands of away, miles away in the farthest colony, but none in Rome. Why? Where do you not need a statue of Caesar? Where the real guy lives, right? Are you tracking? But where do you need one? In the farther outermost points of the colonies to do what, by the way? Why do, why, like, why do we have statues out there? Hey, this is who is in charge. This is who the authority is. This is the king. I think that's a really interesting way, by the way, to think about what it means to be an image bearer or a human in the heaven and earth dimension, okay? That it specifically says God created the heavens and the earth and that humans were created on earth to be those outermost statues that, sh that do what? What's our job? To live in a way that says what? This is who's in charge. This is who is in charge. Are you doing that in your relationships, in the way that you're going about dating, in the way you're treating her, in the way you're treating him? Are you showing who is in charge? Yahweh or you, by the way, because there's only one true king. But we all have a choice to show who that is. And I'll just go with that one step farther too, by the way. That's an interesting way to think about sin and hell, if you think about it. When, let, when a statue is in the farther, farthest outermost points of a colony, and let's say you know, a new empire takes over that colony and Rome is no longer in charge there, two things, there's two possibilities that would happen to that statue. What? One, the enemy either just tears it down or two, because they're not that, they don't care about Caesar, they no longer maintain it and it begins to crumble. What a fascinating picture of sin. What a fascinating picture of sin. That when you stop reflecting God's image and you take on something else in your heart and you give it ultimate allegiance, then you begin to crumble your humanness. 
or in a way, and the enemy actually wants to attack it and tear you down. And I think, by the way, that's an interesting look at hell. Hell is nothing more than basically God saying, you don't want the image of, of, of my, me, me on you anymore? Okay. And he just takes the entire image off. And there's historical precedent, by the way, for that. C.S. Lewis, Tim Keller, some of the early church fathers, that's how they would describe it. Hell is this gnarly place where it's actually God saying, you don't want my image on you anymore? Okay, fine. What would we be like without the image of God? I don't know, but I don't want to see it. And again, so many of us in the choices we're making with our sexuality, with our bodies, with our hearts, with our thoughts, and with our minds, because we are not showing and being under the authority of God, we are crumbling our humanness. We are eroding and destroying ourselves by the decisions we're making by not being under the authority and the reign and rule of God. That's what it means to be an image bearer. Another way, the last way I'll put it before the next point is, when you're an image bearer, your life and your body is telling a story. Your life and your body is telling a story. Let it be the true one. Let it be the right one. Let it be the one of human flourishing and goodness. Another way to say it is don't let your body say something that your life isn't. Anyone who's having sex before marriage, you're basically just letting your body tell a lie. You're basically saying, you know, I don't want to be with you for life. I don't want to join in a covenant. I don't want to do all these things, but I'm going to let my body say that that's true. I'm going to let my body tell that story when nothing else in my life tells that story. God's a cohesive God, by the way. He's a God of unity, where he actually created sexuality to not be this random thing that's arbitrary, but actually for it to be a picture that's lining up with everything else that's already happening. That we are under a covenant together. That we are brought together in joinment, right? In the scriptures, the two will become what? One flesh. In sexuality, in finances, in life, in emotions, whatever it is, there is a merging of two people becoming one. Don't let your body tell a lie. Point two, God seemed to say here, and then also in chapter two, that he gave them a massive, enormous job to do, and that they can't do it alone, so he actually creates a team. He doesn't just create Adam and say, okay, now go do what I just asked you to do. He immediately says, specifically there, but also in Genesis 2, around 13 and 14, that you cannot do this alone, and so what? I have created a, you to be a team. I have created a, a, a distinct, different individual from you that you can merge together with her and go on mission together. God created us in our relationships to be a team. When you're dating, when you're in that season of looking for someone you want to spend the rest of your life with, the best thing you should be asking is, does this person make me a better team, a better person? Do they actually take me? I don't want to say it in like a, um, a, 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 an egotistical way, but like, does this person make me better? Does that make sense? Like, do they make me better spiritually, uh, um, emotionally, and all these different types of things? Do they actually cre- do they make me more into the image of God by being, being merged with them? That's a question you should ask. But you know what's funny is the Western narratives tend to be the opposite. We're not looking for teams, we're looking for clones. Is that not true? The Western narrative of romance is I just want someone like me so that I don't have to wrestle with any of my crap. Right? If that person looks like me, talks like me, acts like me, and never annoys me, well, then I don't have to deal with any of my crap. Isn't the team an opposite, the opposite truth? What does any sports team do? They actually cherish and celebrate what? when someone is different than them. They actually say, I have enormous gaps. I cannot play every position. So I need someone that can play a different position. I need someone that has, can fill those gaps. I need someone that has a different skill set. Both man and woman should be talking like that and thinking like that, that actually, instead of us wanting someone more like us, we should want someone that specifically is different so that we can be a more rounded team to go on the mission God has for us. God wants to send you on mission, and marriage is essentially creating a team for you to accomplish what he has for you. Do you believe in that, and do you trust in that? Another way to think, too, is that God, so many of us, we're only, we think uh, love is face-to-face, right? If only I can find a relationship where we're just face-to-face and we just stare lovingly into each other's eyes and watch Netflix and rom-coms and all these things. By the way, speaking of rom-coms, that's like a dead genre now. Doesn't that kind of suck? 
Those were like amazing back then, and they just like started like stop making them. And yeah. What was that one with Rebel Wilson though, where they kind of like spoofed it? Hilarious. You should watch it. I can't remember if it's R though, so maybe not. Anyways, okay. Um, tangent. But so many of us, we think that love or marriage is only about face to face, when in reality, specifically in Genesis, it's actually shoulder to shoulder. It's not about looking across the aisle for someone to complete you or fulfill you, but it's actually shoulder to shoulder. Who can I go do God's work with? Who can I actually accomplish the mission with? Who actually, level, like, who actually levels each other up? That's who I want to join myself with. And by the way, the antithesis is also a helpful diagnostic. Who makes you worse? Who just erodes the image of God in you? Who absolutely just shames you for what you feel like your calling is or who you're created to be or where you wanna go or the dreams God's laid on your heart? If you're in a dating relationship and you feel like that stuff is getting sunk and oppressed and, and kind of like uh, put down, you need to break up immediately, okay? Amen, Thank you. <laughs> oh, you felt that, you felt that. Um, glad I'm not alone, thank you. But it's true, it's true. Or you could say too, especially for the ladies, this is a really helpful one, and I, I guess you could do it on reverse, you could do it both, but another helpful diagnostic if you're dating is say, um, okay, if we get married and we have kids that are exactly like that other person, so ladies, okay, if we get married and I have a son and my son turns, ex turns out to be exactly like my husband, does that make you cringe or make you excited? <laughs> if that makes you cringe, I think you know what you should do. But so many of us, we stay in these relationships for I have no idea why, reasons, when we know that person's holding us down. We know that person is not activating us in the spirit and allowing us to go on mission together. You know they don't make you better. You have to ask those hard questions now. Because can I just say too, by the way, if you're not asking it now, it'll just get 10 times worse in marriage. 10 times worse. This is the time to ask the hard questions. This is the time to make the hard decisions. When you are dating and looking for someone to partner with on God's mission. Point three, he then gives them a specific domain and job title in what we just read. He says, be fruitful and multiply, number one. And then number two, it says he put them in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. What I like to say is, we're all gardeners. We all are gardeners according to Genesis. What does it mean to be a gardener? In the actual technical definition, a gardener is someone who basically takes raw materials and then uses some of the, the, out, you know, the outside resources as well, sun, rain, et cetera, like that. They take those raw materi materials, and what do they do with it? They do two things. They either, one, make something beautiful, right? Something that's just compelling and powerful, like a flower or bed or something like that. Or what? Or they make something that is nourishing and feeds you, agriculture, crops, et cetera. The job of a gardener is to make something beautiful or to make something that feeds you. Now, all of us, that's a really helpful definition for what it means for, again, your vocation, for your life. The question is, what is your specific garden? What domain has God called you to, whether it's law, whether it's medicine, whether it's the creative arts, whether it's finance, I don't know what it is, but that is a garden that you can actually worship God in by creating order out of chaos, creating something that's beautiful or creating something that nourishes people spiritually, emotionally, physically, whatever it is. What is your garden? And a helpful question when you're dating is, do you have the same garden as the other person? You don't have to have the same job as them, but there should be a big enough fence where we want to play together in here. We wanna to build together in here. We wanna create something that God has asked us to do in this boundary realm. But if you feel like you're on opposite ends of the spectrum or doing, you know, totally going, pulling opposite ways, then that probably might not be a wise decision. There's something about God that he calls them to merge, and then what does he do? And then he, it says, he literally places them. That's what it says, he places them in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So he merges them first, then he places them in the garden to work together. We are given gardens to steward, and marriage is about being on mission together. So ask yourself what that is, what that looks like, who that is. Is that person, maybe that person, you haven't even met that person yet, right? Or whatever it is. But God is calling you to be on mission. Hey, imagine if a team, imagine if a sports team just hung out in the locker room all day and just kind of told stories to each other. Would that be weird? Right? Oh man, I love you, bro. I love you, bro. Hey, you're awesome. You're awesome. Do you think that'd be weird sooner or later? Probably actually sooner, right? Why? What's a team supposed to do? A team's supposed to go play the game. 
A team's supposed to go win the championship. But so many of us, that's pretty much what I just described, what we actually believe is the ideal of romance and relationships. Let's just sit in the locker room and just tell each other good things. Now, by the way, can I just be clear that that, as well as the face-to-face is the other metaphor for it, is necessary. But I would consider that the glue and the goodness God has created for relationships for you to go do the bigger thing, which is be on mission together. Now, if you go on mission together without the face-to-face, then it's dry, it's hard, it's difficult, and, the, and, and without the glue, there is usually fracturing. So they are meant to go together, but a lot of us, we are totally fine with just the sitting, hanging out, and just staring lovingly into each other's eyes. When that's more like the locker room where you prep, you check out the whiteboard, you run up the plays, then you go on into the game. Then you go play the game. Then you go pursue what God has for you. And so that's what we have to think about when we read Genesis and think about that, that God is giving you a garden to go play the game. So what would that be? And think about, when you think about that too, a a couple helpful questions you can maybe ask yourself in that is just talk to the person more with asking them dreams, hopes, visions, et cetera. I think so many times I, I hear dating relationships and it, you, you know, you'll be like, have you asked them what they wanna do or where they wanna be in 10 years? Or where I'm, not, I'm not saying they have to have a perfect answer to that, by the way, because does anyone else hate that question? You're, where are you gonna be in five years? Like, I don't know. And any answer I said, I definitely didn't look like that five years ago. Now, but it is helpful in just like stirring the heart, stirring the mind of are they going somewhere? A really good word for it is trajectory, trajectory. Are you on a trajectory that this person is on? Because you should be going the same direction, either in maturity level, in a spiritual maturity level, or in a vocational level, but going the same direction on a certain trajectory is deeply, deeply important. And so that's what we have to ask. Point four is this. Then what we see too is that, what do we see with Jesus? That Jesus comes in the gospels and beautifully shows us what? That we don't have what it takes, that we are not good enough, that we have failed, but what? His love is there for us. He meets us in this place, and he wants to know you. Another way to think about it is those three points I just named, Jesus perfectly fulfills. Have you ever thought about who's the truest image of God? Jesus. He is the actual fulfiller of The image, it even says that in Colossians, that he is the image of the invisible God, not only as an image of God, but he also as the truly human one showed us what it's like, that he was the perfect divine reflection. He was the perfect divine reflection that comes down and goes out towards us. Then he doesn't go solo, he goes on a team mission with the Holy Spirit and the Father, constantly referencing them, constantly saying he needs them, constantly saying he needs to meet with them. And then what? And then point number three, he then reveals his garden, which is what? All of us, our hearts, our minds, the, our sinful nature, the earth, that he, he is the ultimate maker of order out of chaos in our lives in our marriages, in our dating relationships, in our finances, in all these different types of things that God is for us. God is with us and that any place that we failed in being these proper divine reflections, he has fulfilled for us by his grace. I think about, we can fast forward uh, Genesis one, Genesis two, and then Genesis three. What happens in Genesis three? The curse. So they're given this big mandate, they're given this big mission, they're given this big job, and they fail. They eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They say, I can do it on my own, which so many of us, were still living that lie today. In relationships, in our sexuality, I can do it on my own. And it's this whisper from Satan or the Satan figure, actually, is what it is in Hebrew. Do you know, by the way, total trivia and random known fact, but we call him Satan, but you know that actual figure in Scripture has no proper name, right? It's the serpent or the Satan in Hebrew, which just literally means the accuser. Satan, we call him that, and I'm just going to call him that right now just for reference sake. He actually doesn't have a true name. And there's actually God trying to do a point there, by the way. What gets names in Scripture? 
we literally actually just read it. It's a couple verses after Genesis 1, 28 and 29. What gets names? Anything that's created, anything that shows order, anything that's put in the garden. Who's the antithesis of order? Who's the king of chaos? The accuser, the serpent, the Satan figure. And so it's actually, I think, God in some way and the writers of the scriptures kind of saying he is so the antithesis of chaos and evil that he doesn't deserve a name. He doesn't deserve a name because he only seeks to kill and destroy and steal. He only seeks to unravel. His job is to breed chaos in our lives, in our relationships. And he does it almost primarily by whispering in our ear, you can do it alone, you can do it on your own, and you are the king of your own life. Those are his primary tools and his primary whispers that he constantly is putting into our ear. And nowhere does it wreak more havoc than in relationships. I don't know about you, but I mean, I had a hor like my childhood is, is, was pretty horrible. And I think about like my, like no, no one really walks with the Lord in my family, right? Uh, my, my parents never got married. Um, you know, my mom had been to like juvenile hall. My dad had been to prison. Just a really, really, really pretty rough upbringing. And I look back on that and I'm just like, yep, rings true that Satan just breeds chaos and disorder. Like so many of us, is that not our story? Maybe even you had a healthy family but you never felt known, you never felt seen, you feel like the pressure was insurmountable, you feel like you could never actually perform good enough for your parents to love you, or maybe it was severely broken by the world's standards. Whatever it is, so many of us, I think it would be clear for us to say that yes, objectively, we understand sin can erode relationships, even if we're not thinking about ours, but the ones above us. How it's informed us, how it's ruined us, how it's wounded us. That it can hurt us, that, that, if, that, that have we not seen, basically? It's funny how we just keep making the same mistakes generationally, is what I'm trying to say. So many of us, have we not seen that when you say that you're the king of your own life, or you make your own decisions, or you don't listen to God's blueprint, you don't step into God's design, it does not end well. It breeds chaos and disorder and hurt and pain. It's the brokenness of this word shalom in the garden, that, that this, this order, this dance of creation, that when you are living within God's design, it's like, a, it's like a music. It's like rhythmic. It's beautiful. It's compelling. But there's something about sin that breaks the music and just wreaks havoc on our lives. And music is a really good Metaphor too, by the way, that music is kind of objective in the, in, in the sense of the rhythm, meaning it is just, a rhythm would just be constant, a beat, right? It would just be going at a certain way. Um, we don't get to make up the music is what I'm trying to say. You don't get to make up the music. Now, you can be creative of how you dance in the music, right? And it might not be good. We got some white people in the room, so I understand. But, <laughs> you ever, I mean, come on, we've all seen that guy at the wedding, right? Where it's like, I don't think, no, 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are. You know who you are. So when music is playing, you cannot make up the music. Your job is to submit to music and dance within it, but you are allowed to be creative within that submission. Again, I think that's a beautiful picture of relationships, God's design, that they are not rigid God's design so much in our culture is this, it's that it's God is constrictive, God is oppressive, God is, you know, rigid. Now, there might be restraint that he calls us to, and I would believe it does feel like that and sound like that in our culture, and it absolutely does. But within that restraint, there is freedom, just like someone who's enjoying dancing. You're not saying it's rigid to not dance on beat, you're just saying you look stupid. You look ridiculous. That's not how you do it. It's that simple. That's not rigid. That's just almost like a law of nature, that just music works in a certain way, and you can be creative within it. And so that's God's design, again, for relationships and for us. One, one more tangent that I just thought of, and then, and then I'll, I'll close here in a sec, is that's actually a big point in our culture, right? That our culture's highest value, specifically with the 35 and under crowd, which that would be me and, 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 and peers and stuff, would be that nothing should inhibit my freedom. Nothing should inhibit my freedom. That's like the highest Western ideal. And are we not seeing that play out in all these cultural battles, Right? that the highest ideal in the West is that I should be able to do what I want, when I want, how I want, and anything that constricts that is evil or wrong or oppressive or from the patriarchy, <laughs> right? Don't you guys just love, okay, never mind. I'm not gonna, okay. Just gonna, we're gonna move on from that one, that word, okay. 
But in fact, that's not true freedom. True freedom always involves restraint at some level. A, a good metaphor would be like skydiving, right? Now, when you skydive, that's like the epitome of freedom, right? You're just jumping out of a plane, flying through the air. It feels super free, exhilarating, and amazing. There's no restraints. Well, kind of, is there? What, what's kind of restraining you? A parachute. Now, if you wanted to be a little bit more free, because that kind of felt like it was getting a little tight, and might, you might chafe, and you want to take it off, what's going to happen to you? You're going to die. So in that scenario, it sounds like restraint actually brings more freedom. Are you tracking? In that scenario, it actually sounds like if I submit to the restraints, I will actually be able to enjoy this way more. Same with sex. Same with relationships. Same with dating. Same with marriage. That when you understand God's design and when you understand the restraints he has placed in there, you will be able to enjoy it way better. It's actually God saying, play, enjoy, eat, be fruitful, be multiply. This is amazing, incredible. But within this context, you go outside of that context and you're just playing against the music. God, the, the, the thing I want you to hear tonight is, is he's playing a music. Are you dancing to it in your relationship? Are you trying to tune your ear to it every morning? What a cool way to think about prayer, by the way. Is it is, this is a time to listen to God and almost be a tuning fork to his music, his voice, his love over me. That's what it means to live in a healthy way in that blueprint. And I'll, I'll end with this. So we get to Genesis 3, the curse comes, and there's this really fascinating thing that shows up of how God responds to the first human sinning that I think we just kind of skip over because we kind of just assume, well, yeah, we've read the rest of the story. Of course, God's loving and kind, et cetera. But let's just tra- back, go back a little bit, okay? So they sin, but by the way, like, did that not seem like they sinned in five seconds? Anyone else? Like, it was so quick. He said, do not eat of the tree, and what they do five seconds later? They ate of the tree. Now, God would have every reason, especially with that royal language in Genesis, that these are the royal ambassadors of Yahweh himself. Maybe at a high-level justice way, I don't know, to just go Thanos and snap his finger and they disappear. I don't know. But he could have, he would have been justified in responding that way. That's what I'm trying to say. But yet, if we hadn't read the rest of the scriptures, I feel like you'd be on the edge of your seat of like, what is God going to do in this moment? These image bearers, these royal priests, these divine representatives, I mean the representatives of the divine, these image bearers, they just usurped and kind of went against the king? What is he going to do? Now what does he do? He does something very weird. What's God's very first response to the first time sin enters into the world? What's he do? He asks a question. That's his first response. The very first time sin enters into the world, after he just created everything, it was beautiful, it was amazing, and it was awesome, and it was incredible, the very first thing God does is asks a question. Two, actually. But why is that weird? God should be never asking questions, amen? Isn't that kind of like against the, like, isn't that not really the, like, if you're God, you don't really need to be asking that, right? Unless what? Unless what? God is maybe asking rhetorically, or it's actually trying to show us something. Now, what was the question? What was the very first thing out of God's mouth? They sin, the curse breaks, everything comes into the world, and then God comes looking for them in the garden, asks a question, and the question is what? Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Now again, do you think he really needs to know? Like, hey, what bush, bro? I can't find you. Do you think he's legitimately asking, Adam, send me the GPS coordinates right now. Log into my Find My Friends app and let me know where you're at. No. Again, unless God is rhetorically in that moment setting a precedent that we have to saturate ourselves in, and that is God actually calling them back to himself immediately. Immediately. He's actually saying, Adam, where are you? Where is my son? Where is my daughter? Why are you hiding? Why are you hiding? The first response from God is actually to go look from them and then to call them out of hiding. That's enormously incredible. Like his default position to sin, that's another way you could put it. His default, like how his first response to sin in the world is to go looking for them and call them out of it. Go looking for them. And he, by the way, he calls them by name. How beautiful is that? 
He calls you by name when he's calling you out of your sin, when he's calling you out of hiding, when he's calling you out of your shame, when he's calling you out of anything that is unraveling your humanness, breeding that chaos, breeding that disorder. He's calling you out of it. Tonight, maybe. Tonight. Masturbation, sleeping with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, whether it's something that was done to you in the past in an abusive way, whatever the shame is, whatever the behavior is, whatever it is, he's calling you out of it tonight. You can find healing tonight. Tonight. He says, where are you? And then they say we were hiding because we were naked and ashamed. And then he says a second question, which is what? Who told you you were naked? Again, it's God reiterating the primal voice over the human saying, who told you you were naked? Who told you you weren't good enough? Who told you you were this, 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 and this? I didn't, that wasn't my voice. That's a different voice, but that's not my voice. The very first voice over you cries love, goodness, image bearer, beloved, his. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that God is calling you out of darkness, out of sin, out of all of these things, into goodness? He wants to plant you back in the garden, equipped by the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit to go on mission with him. And so I'll I'll, I'll say this. When I think about that moment and thinking about Jesus calling out, out of sin and our darkness, I think of the story of Jesus where the, 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 the lady is coming to um, like try to get to him, right? And touches him. And what happens to her? Well, two things. First of all, does Jesus, how crazy is it that Jesus immediately says, who just touched me? And he's in a crowd of like a bajillion people. So it's like, well, bro, isn't everyone kind of, right? But he says, who touched me? So it shows you his awareness and his power. And then, by the way, what's it say? She had been, I think, sick and bleeding for 14 years from what I can remember from the story. And then what's it say? Upon touching her, she is instantly healed. Instantly healed. Now, you know what's crazy about that story? Before the New Testament, darkness or uncleanliness tended to win. Now, here's what I mean by that. I don't mean that God wasn't powerful then or God wasn't healing, but just even ceremonially, according to the Torah, if something clean came in contact with something unclean in the Old Testament, Almost every single time, if they were to touch an unclean and a clean person or thing or whatever, what would win? Meaning would both leave clean or would both leave unclean? Both would be made unclean. The uncleanliness would kind of like transpose itself, right? And you know what's crazy about Jesus in the New Testament? It's completely reversed. Anything that comes in contact with Jesus, what happens? Clean, instantly. Instantly, healed, righteous, new, beloved, good, simply by reaching out and touching him. And so that's what I wanna leave you guys with tonight, and that's what I want you to think on and just sit on with this last song that'll be here in a minute, is have you first of all reached out and touched him? Have you reached out and touched him? Have you been made new? Because the minute you say yes to Jesus and all that unraveling that sin was doing, you begin to start re-raveling in new creation. That's what it means to walk with Jesus, is all you're doing is re-raveling yourself. I know it's a weird way to put it, but you're re-raveling your imageness to be made more in the image of who? Him. And then when we resurrect and are fully glorified, that job is perfected and done. That job is perfected and done. That's what it means to be an image bearer under the submission and authority of Jesus. So have you reached out and touched him? And then if you have... Have you been placed in that garden? Do you understand that mission? And are you on a trajectory of trying to find a teammate that will take you in the direction God wants you and make you better and be a partner that'll actually go on mission with you and not hold you down? Let me pray for you guys. Jesus, I just pray for everyone in this room, Lord thinking, just feeling that weight right now of the the diversity of life story in this room. Whether it's a good family upbringing, a bad family upbringing, whether it's some serious dark stuff that's been done against us, whether it's some stuff that we have done against other people, whether there's maybe just even like something, stuff that we don't feel like was crazy, bad, or been done against us, but we just feel numb. We just feel like we have what we should have and what we need, but we just feel like we're empty. We just feel numb. 
And so, Lord, I just pray a blessing. I pray a healing over everyone in this room tonight, Lord. And as this song plays, maybe we shout it out as a praise to you, but maybe we let it wash over us as well and we just listen. And that this song can maybe be a reminder of that primal voice in the garden, the first voice that says, where are you? You can come out of hiding. And Lord, we thank you for the blueprint that the minute we come out of hiding, we are touched, healed, renewed, and new. And then we have the blueprint. We can continue to take steps forward to first of all be on mission ourselves. That Lord, you give us missions as image bearers individually. And that we can focus, we can point ourselves towards you. And if you wanna bring someone to the left or to the right to join in on that party, then amen, let it be so. But Lord, let us be faithful either way, in singleness, in relationships. Let us be faithful, faithful with our bodies, faithful with our thoughts. Lord, let our, our bodies, our thoughts, and our hearts and our minds do exactly what we talked about in the beginning. Say, this is who is in charge. This is who is king. Might we be image bearers and living statues going out where people say, oh, that's what it looks like. That's what divine love and goodness and blessing looks like. That's what the king looks like. That's what who I'm created to actually be like maybe looks like. The one calling me into love and forgiveness. So Lord, we thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. In your name we pray, amen.